Um, well, well, thanks for having me. Um, this isn't my first time here. I was here, I think, twice last year. Um, don't get invited back. I'll know I did it wrong this time, I guess. Um, I think the last time I was here, I talked about water resources in Idaho. And um, the piece that, that was based on just appeared like two weeks ago. So if you Google my name and water history, you'll be able to read um, those thoughts. It's really exciting to see so many people here, and I'm actually completely overwhelmed. The last time I was here, maybe 12, 14 people were here. Um, so, you've heard good things about the secrets. I'm here today to do it. Um, so, as Dulce mentioned in her kind introduction, I'm working on a book on public lands. I just uh, I published, well, it's in process, a piece, kind of the overview of all of this. and. I'm going to kind of go off of that as a script today, and I want to be informal. I want to have time for questions and answers. I tend to get carried away, so I may not. Um, we'll see how I do. What I think I'll start with, though, is I will read to you my abstract from that piece that's about to appear. It's pretty dense. I apologize for that, but it gives you the whole thing, so you have a place to put anything that I say afterwards in place. So for more than a century after the Republic's founding in the 1780s, American law reflected the ideal that the commons, the public domain, should be turned into private property. As Americans became concerned about resource scarcity, waste, and monopolies at the end of the 19th century, reform-minded bureaucrats and scientists convinced Congress to maintain in perpetuity some of the nation's land as public. This shift offered a measure of protection and an alternative to private property regimes. The federal agencies that primarily manage these lands today, the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, have worked since their origins in the early decades of the 20th century to fulfill their diverse, competing, and evolving missions. Meanwhile, the public and Congress have continually demanded new and different goals as the land itself has functioned and responded in interdependent ways. In the mid-20th century, the agencies intensified their management, hoping they could satisfy the rising and often conflicting demands American citizens placed on the public lands. This intensification often worsened public lands ecology and increased political conflict, resulting in a series of new laws in the 1960s and 1970s. Those laws strengthened the role of science and the public in influencing agency practices while providing more opportunities for litigation. Predictably, since the late 1970s, these developments polarized public lands politics. The economies, but also the identities of many Americans remain entwined with the public lands, making political standoffs over endangered species, oil production, privatizing land, and more, common and increasingly intractable. Because the public lands are national in scope, but used by local people for all manner of economic and recreational activities, they have been and remain microcosms of the federal democratic system in all its conflicted nature. So I'll take questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story in a very compact nutshell. Um, and I'm sorry that was so dense, and I'm sorry I read it. It's not really the way to do these sorts of things. But that gives you a sense of, of the overview and where I'm going. Um, and I guess I'll just try to provide some more details about all of that as I, as I move forward. 
So land has shaped American history from its very beginning. It was one of the draws of, that brought Europeans to North America in the first place. It was questions over land is what prompted, in many cases, the push towards a revolution in the 1770s that we're all familiar with. Um, so it, it's really central. I think that's a really important thing to recognize. It's a really central element um, to all of American history. So when we talk about land, we're talking about everything, not just this one little slice. Okay? So I think that that's, that's something important for us to keep in mind. Thomas Jefferson famously wrote in his notes on the state of Virginia, uh, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people whose breasts he had made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. This is the Jeffersonian faith that drives so much of American land policy throughout the 19th century and in much of American myth in the 20th century. It was important for there to be land available for there to be farmers to farm. And this is really what the 19th century is sort of all about. Let me explain how that works. Right after the American Revolution, we were governed, this nation was governed by something called the Articles of Confederation. Most of us sort of freeze right over it, and nothing much happens during that period. That's why we had to have a constitution. But there was this one really important element that happened in 1785 and in 1787. We passed something called the Northwest Land Ordinance. And what this did, shouldn't have shut the door. <laughs> I can back up the front row and the front row. Okay. 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 This is the test. I stopped at the consent to see if I can pick up where I was. <laughs> so what the land ordinance did in the 1780s was it figured out a way transform the public domain, the land that was not owned by any individual, into land that could be owned by individuals. It sent surveyors out west to carve up the entire continent into squares, square miles. We'd survey this out, and the government would sell it. We didn't have an income tax. The government had to get money somehow. Land sales was one of them. The federal government gave that land to veterans, and then people bought it. Land companies bought it. It didn't work as well as they wanted. Um, the price was cheap, but not cheap enough for most regular people. By the, um, by the 1860s, we gave it away. We're starting with the Homestead Act, 1862. back up just for one second. That's not exa actually a back up, sort of a backing up. As this was all happening, one of the things the federal government was doing, with the help of its army, was taking over other land. It happened through wars of conquest. It happened through treaties, some of which uh, two nations came together as equals, some of which were manipulated. Um, it happened through purchase or combinations of all of those things going on. So gradually by, whenever it was that we gained Hawaii, 1898 or something like that, the, the country that we know now existed as American, as the United States. And so we apply this, this essential square mile grid all across this continent and we give it away because we're trying to fulfill what Jefferson is talking about, right? This is what virtuous people do before. And by that, they will add goodness and improvement to the world and to the republic and save the republic and we will be fantastic and wonderful and all. And it, it's a little more complicated than that as you, of course, might recognize. So we keep moving this direction and people are populating the continent and they hit the American West, which of course is the best part of the nation. <laughs> of course. But it doesn't, the, that, that grid system doesn't work particularly well here. There's places where there aren't, where trees don't grow really well. There's places where there's not a lot of water to grow crops. 
And so this system, just sort of foundational economic liberalism, government helping individuals to develop their economy, breaks down. And so we adjust our policies toward the public lands. We do things like, well, we'll give you more land if you promise to bring water to it. Or we'll give you more land if you promise to plant trees. Which some thought would then bring rain. <laughs> this was a way to get more of that public domain into individuals' hands. And individual private property is the great story of America, right? But they, these, these acts fail. The, the proving up rate, like the percentage of people who get those lands, is like 25%. So it doesn't work real well. Now I'm in big <laughs> So that doesn't work very well. What it does is it provides opportunities for railroad companies, logging companies, and others to acquire vast acreages, which is not what the law was supposed to do. Now, there were laws that were supposed to do that. The federal government gave away to railroads immense acreages of land. When you add it all up, it's larger than any state except for Alaska and Texas. It's a big chunk of land. Big gift to corporations in the end of the 19th century. Now there's a reason for that, and there's a public good that's supposed to be being served. People are isolated out in the American West, and they need to be connected to markets so that the primary goods that we can produce here and the consumer goods that are produced there can be connected. And it does good. The railroad does good. It does other things too, but it does do some good things that helps knit together the country. But all of these things that are going around towards the end of the 19th century, people are starting to worry. They see fraud, because a lot of these land laws are, are, are not done the way they were supposed to. I, if I were the head of a lumber company, I might grab someone that just gets off a ship in San Francisco Harbor and say, hey, go fill out this land claim and then sign it over to me. Okay. Good way to get a lot of land real cheap. And so people said this isn't going to work for a variety of reasons. We don't like the fraud, but we also are worried about waste. So now we're going to get out of the West for just a minute and go to the Midwest. One of the things happening at the end of the 19th century in the Midwest is terrible, horrible logging practices. Logging companies come into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and they just destroy forests very, very fast and then just move on. And this doesn't, increasingly doesn't seem like the right thing to do to scientists, bureaucrats, and the American government working for the Bureau of Forestry and things like that. So we start to call for a reform. <coughs> and this, is, this starts bubbling up in the 18, 1860s, somebody starts talking about 1870s, more 1880s, even more people. Pause with that story, I'll get back to it. One of the other things that happened in the 1870s was there were some, surf, uh, some explorers out in the West and they stumbled upon this pretty magnificent, crazy place called Yellowstone. And as they're there, they're like, this, wow, this is strange. Look at these geysers and these pools. This is really amazing. And they hear people talking about like maybe a railroad company, maybe some private individuals wanting to claim it as their own. And there are folks in the government like, I think this is a bad idea. So they persuade Congress to, to, to not let an individual or a company own it, but to reserve it forever as a park. First national park in the world history.